Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Lauren Downing Peters, and she was born here in Kansas City, currently works in Chicago, and I'm really excited to hear Lauren's presentation today, Dr. Downing Peters' presentation today, because she's going to bring a different perspective to some of what you may have already heard, and I think it's going to be one that many of you will uh, be very glad to hear. She is a scholar, lecturer, and editor of the topics of inclusive design, body positivity, and thinking beyond standardized sizing. She has obtained the following degrees, a Bachelor of Arts, double majoring in art history and anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis, a Master of Fine Arts in, uh, Master of Arts in Fashion Studies from Parsons School of Design, the New School in New York City, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Fashion Studies from the Center for Fashion Studies or Stockholm University in Sweden. Thereafter, she joined the faculty of Columbia College in Chicago at the rank of assistant professor in the fashion studies department. And there she teaches the fashion history and theory class and works with her colleagues to develop forward thinking and inclusive design, merchandising and product development curriculum. She is also, as if that were not enough, she is also the editor in chief of the fashion studies journal, New York, New York, and is a frequent lecturer and studies at Parsons Paris, the new school in Paris, France. Would you please join me in welcoming now to the stage, Dr. Lauren Downing Peters. All right, hi everyone. Um, so first and foremost, I just want to thank Rightfully Sown and specifically Jennifer Latka for inviting me here to speak to all of you today. As you heard in my bio, my studies and work have taken me all over the world, but there's something so incredibly special about being able to close this circle and come and talk about the future of inclusive design in front of a like-minded community of innovators and makers. Um, I also just want to note, however, that it is sort of weird for someone like me to be at a conference like this, specifically an industry conference, but I'm really happy that Jennifer had the vision to bring me here because I do think that the industry and people who are looking to get into the industry can actually learn a lot from fashion history and theory. So I'm really happy to kind of um, bring these two worlds together. So before I climb onto my size inclusive soapbox this morning, I want to talk a bit about some language and some terms I'm going to be using. First, you'll note that I'm going to play pretty fast and loose with the term fat. Please don't be alarmed. Um, my decision to do so is actually in keeping with calls made by fat activists and scholars to reclaim the term fat as a neutral descriptor. In other versions of this talk, I've also used the word plus size in the title, but as many of you I'm sure know, the term plus size has come onto the chopping block in recent years. Perhaps most famously, Ashley Graham rejected the title of plus size model and thereafter called for brands and designers to abolish the term altogether. Others have similarly argued that in the era of body positivity, the term has mostly outlived its usefulness, and that's an idea I generally agree with. However, I can't quite quit plus size. It's too just in, embedded in my vocabulary. So I've decided to use the term inclusive in my title, but with an asterisk. Uh, and this is because my focus, of course, is going to be specifically on size inclusivity. Although I care deeply about and advocate for other forms of inclusivity in the fashion industry from gender fluid and non-binary fashion to fashions for the elderly and for disabled people. My work as an educator and activist lies solidly within the realm of reforming fashion design curriculum to make it more size inclusive, but also in exposing my students to the history of plus size fashion and to the experiences of women who for so long have been marginalized and stigmatized by the fashion industry, told that their bodies are wrong and other. Um, in order to drive this point home a little more, I'm going to quickly run through some statistics. Very much like Katie, I like numbers and I think they're very convincing. So first off, did you know that the average American woman is a size 16? When I ask my students how big they think the average American woman is, they oftentimes guess that she's probably close to a size 6 or 8, and this makes sense, right? If the spectrum of standard sizes is 0 to 12, then the intermediary size in that range is going to be a 6 or 8. Plus size, on the other hand, is an ancillary category we've learned. It's one that's literally relegated to the dark corners of retail stores and department stores, and which is really difficult to find or is hidden within the menus of e-commerce websites. Even though plus size fashion is marginal, plus size women are not. A colleague of mine, Dr. Deborah Crystal of Washington State University, 
found in a recent study that approximately 67% of American women are plus size, and that the average amongst them is a size 16, which places her very solidly past that standard plus size threshold. Um, another statistic for you. So with the rise of the mainstream body positivity movement over the last 10 years, we've come to see more and more fat women within the fashion media. However, did you know that the average plus size model is closer to a size eight or 10 and sometimes even smaller? The fashion industry has all kinds of dirty tricks up its sleeves, but perhaps one of the most misleading is the practice of padding out plus size models to fit into much larger ready-made plus size clothes. The curves that we oftentimes see in the fashion media are therefore both artfully constructed and artificial. This creates a condition in which the images of fat embodiment that we see in the media do not track or align with what real women look like, thereby establishing new standards for, of idealized fatness in which fat appears in all the right places, namely at the bust and at the, uh, at the hips, sorry, and conspicuously not at the waist. Another statistic I want to present to you has to do with the dollar value of the plus size sector. As of 2018, plus size fashion was, worth, was estimated at being worth uh, $21 billion, um, which is roughly 18% of the women's apparel market. What this statistic obscures, however, is the fact that the full potential of plus size fashion has yet to be reached. Indeed, if more mainstream retailers would jump onto the plus size bandwagon, this statistic would be closer to $46 billion with estimates that it could reach as much as $60 billion by next year. Driving this point home a bit more, plus size fashion is actually one of the fastest growing sectors of the fashion industry just behind athleisure. While the industry as a whole has been slowing down, growing at only 1.5% annually, the plus size sector is growing at 6% annually with no signs of a slowdown. This being in spite of the fact that the industry still, still tends to neglect fat women. So at this point, you must be wondering what's in a number and when is she going to like, get over it and start talking about the future of inclusive design. Well, I argue that in order for us to understand the future of inclusive design, we have to understand in intimate de detail the many ways that the fashion industry has systematically marginalized fat women over the last century. And numbers, I think, are a great way to drive this point home. Um, to that end, numbers are important to remember and to internalize for two reasons. First and foremost, plus size fashion is good business, full stop. It's no secret that the fashion industry has been struggling to adapt in recent years. Storied brands like J. Crew are struggling to adapt to the exacting needs of Gen Z and millennials, while strip mall staples like Dress Barn and Payless brands that we grew up with here in the Midwest are shutting down entirely. Within this hostile market, the plus size sector continues its upward ascent, even as the many mainstream retailers still refuse to bring fat women into the fold. Which begs the question, if plus size fashion is such good business, then why do struggling brands still neglect fat women? For an answer to this question, we need not look farther than to one of the founding fathers of modern fashion, the one and only Paul Poiré. Some of you might know him either as the man who liberated women from the corset in the early 20th century, while others of you might know him as the great cultural appropriator who set the fashion for Orientalist fashions in the 1920s. Either way, did you guys know that he was also in the business of policing fat women's bodies at the same time he was claiming their liberation? During one of his American tours in 1923, Poiré mused to the Philadelphia Inquirer about the sad state of fat women's fashion, calling them utterly hopeless and the infirm among the fashionable. He suggested that the reason that fashion designers had tended to neglect fat women is because, quote, their case is not for the dress designer, it is for the physician. Now, Poiré did not single-handedly set the fashion for stigmatizing fat women in the early 20th century. Rather, here, he's merely echoing America's growing distrust and resentment towards fat people in a moment in which attitudes toward health and overweight were rapidly evolving. Within this fat-phobic climate, even as Americans of any socioeconomic status could increasingly walk into a department store or consult a mail-order catalog and buy a garment that fit their body off the rack, Fat women were still largely excluded from this essential experience of consumer culture. Lest you think that this is an antiquated idea, however, let's not forget about the fact that the late and maybe not so great Karl Lagerfeld was quoted as saying that no one wants to see fat women on the catwalk as recently as 2013. After a visit to the Midwest, Anna Wintour also very famously referred to fat women here as little houses and remarked that it would be nearly impossible for fashion designers to create fashionable clothing for them. So 
So if the most powerful people in the fashion industry, both historically and in contemporary culture, have disregarded the needs and wants of fat consumers, what incentive does that give mass market retailers to put their necks out there and take a chance on a little understood market? Well, the answer to that question, of course, is none. In many ways, however, I think that these inflammatory remarks are sort of low-hanging fruit that detract from the real problem. Indeed, even more so than the numbers surrounding the monetary potential of plus-size fashion, I actually think that it's the numbers that are on the inside of our garments that are more powerful and remind us that fashion is a business, but it's also emotional and political. In a 2018 study, Caitlin Bishop and her co-authors interviewed hundreds of women about how they shop and experience standardized sizing. They found that women employ clothing size standards not to just help them find garments to fit their bodies, but that they use these numbers to judge and make claims about both their bodies and about other women's bodies. Indeed, clothing, they found, is actually one of the principal barometers through which we measure our, sel our self-worth, and that, I think, is really sad. And this, I'm sure, is also something that all of us in this auditorium are familiar with, whether or not we're male, female, non-binary, fat, thin, or average. Um, Indeed, I don't think there's anything worse than going to a store, selecting a garment that's your size, only to go to the dressing room and find that it doesn't fit you. And what do we do whenever this happens? We don't blame designers and manufacturers as we should. Instead, we blame our too fleshy, too fat, too imperfect bodies, or perhaps the pint of Ben and Jerry's that we indulged in the night before. This, however, is a relatively new condition. Indeed, throughout much of history, we actually tailored our clothes to fit our bodies. With the rise of mass manufacturing in the ready-to-wear industry in the late 19th century, though, things changed and so began a process in which we began to fit our bodies to our clothes. How many of us, for instance, have ever purchased a dress in a size too small only to promise ourselves that we'll lose that extra five pounds and we'll look smoking in that dress one day? I know I have, and I know that it never works. So sizes, I want to stress, are based on statistical averages, not real bodies. Indeed, standardized sizing is both racist and deeply biased towards a slender ideal. Did you know that the earliest women's sizing surveys in the late 19th century were conducted at elite women's colleges and are therefore based on a small pool of young, wealthy, slender white women? Even more problematically, did you know that there have been few formalized attempts to um, reform this system over the last century? More so than the images of slender models that proliferate in the fashion media and on our Instagram feeds, sizing, I think, is a powerful normalizing tool, one that irons out bodily differences and which entices us to conform and to contort our fleshy, imperfect bodies to fit into garments that were made by machines and increasingly by algorithms. To this point, my favorite fashion theorist, because all of us should have a favorite fashion theorist, Professor Joanne Entwistle writes that conventions of dress transform the flesh into something recognizable and meaningful to a culture and are also the means by which bodies are made decent, appropriate, and acceptable within specific contexts. Indeed, clothing, she argues, is not just a medium through which we individuate ourselves, or as my students love to say, an art form. It is also the principal means by which our bodies are policed and disciplined within contemporary culture. My favorite way to illustrate this point is through the example of the bikini. While these two iconic strips of fabric are completely conventional attire for wearing at the beach or at the swimming pool, you would be censored if you tried to wear a bikini to a dentist appointment or to um, an interview. However, while all bodies are embroiled within webs of power that determine which manners of dressing are appropriate within specific contexts, some bodies, of course, are subject to more acute forms of policing that establish the very ways that they can exist in this world as normal. The fat female body is one such body that has been the object of attempts to control and contain its deviant flesh in the vein of remaking it in the image of the slender ideal. The persistent focus of these regimes has oftentimes been the waist. An extreme example of this discipline is the corset or its modern counterpart, the sphinx. These are objects that physically compress and reshape the body to shave off the appearance of inches even if they don't actually take away pounds. However, some more hard to pin down, perhaps, but perhaps more pervasive regimes are those maxims that are passed down from our grandmothers to our mothers to us, which tell us to avoid horizontal stripes, to not wear things that are too clingy, to not wear things that are too large, and of course, to embrace black, all in the name of figure flattery. So I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of figure flattery, or as I'm calling it now, the tyranny of figure flattery, and the extent to which it pervades contemporary fashion. 
Specifically, I'm intrigued by how these ideas are materialized in and through the design of dress objects, or how designers employ these rules whenever they're making clothes that are supposed to flatter our bodies. Where, however, do these rules come from? So the name Lane Bryant is synonymous with plus size fashion, but Lane Bryant actually began her career as a maternity wear designer. One of her great innovations was the um, adjustable waistband skirt, which actually allowed women to leave the house while they were pregnant. And she was also one of the first designers to actually use the term maternity in an advertisement which appeared in the New York Times in 1907, something that was truly scandalous in its day. It wasn't, however, until she married Albert Malson that Lane Bryant began to make large size clothing, which during this time was somewhat ingloriously known as stout wear. Her husband, Albert Malson, was an engineer and he saw great potential in maternity wear, um, which he realized was easily adaptable to fat bodies. Indeed, as far as he was concerned, the greatest impediment to fashion for fat women was the inability to find well-fitting garments. He therefore surveyed thousands of women, the products of which you can see here, to understand how and why fit was such a problem for them. He thereafter invented a three-part sizing system that took into account not just the size of a body, but the shape of a body as well. Not content to solve the problem of poor fit alone, however, Melson quickly trained his sights on what he soon came to see as a bigger problem, that of how to make the fat body appear more slender. In a series of articles that were published in the media in the early 20th century, Melson talked less about fit than about how certain scientific principles could be applied to the fat woman's dress to fix her body. In one, ar in one article, he actually likened fat women's bodies to buildings, arguing that designers could learn a lot from the principles used by the architects of the great Gothic cathedrals to affect the appearance of height, slenderness, and airy grace in the cumbersome body of the fat woman. While there is something, dare I say, almost liberating about the idea of dressing to look slender without actually having to engage in the practice of weight loss, stoutwear design discourse nevertheless merely served to reify the hegemony of the slender ideal by underscoring the fact that there is only one way to appear in this world as a woman that is not fat. Leaping ahead a century, you may or may not be surprised to hear that even Lane Bryant, a self-styled champion of rule breaking and body positivity, continues to perpetuate the tyranny of figure flattery in their clothing design and advertising. Their so-called power pockets denim, for instance, are said to sculpt and smooth the plus size woman's curves into submission without the pain, expense, and struggle of wearing additional foundations. While much has certainly changed in the fashion industry over the last 100 years, you can see a lot has remained the same. Indeed, if the design and promotion of plus size clothing is any indication, just as in the early 20th century, it seems that the principal goal when dressing as a fat woman is to make your body appear less. I've been thinking a lot about slenderizing and quote, flattering garments lately. For one, I find them aesthetically boring and unimaginative. I think that there's no literally nothing more boring and cliche than a Hervé Leger bandage dress. By contrast, some of the most fabulously imaginative designs of the last 25 years are those that are totally unconcerned with the ideal silhouette. For instance, just think of Victor and Rolf's recent A-line signboard dresses, which were um, a popular item of dress at the camp um, runway, or red carpet. Iris Van Herpen's 3D printed sartorial sculptures in the middle, or my personal favorite, Ray Kawakubo's iconic lumps and bumps from the 80s and 90s. Although these, of course, are extreme examples of haute couture, I nevertheless think that there's a lot for even ready-to-wear designers to chew on and think about here whenever they look at these images. Beyond the boring aesthetic of flattering clothes, though, I do also think that flattering clothes are moralizing to the extent that they impose a fat-phobic worldview onto utterly normal bodies, a point which we've already stressed. Indeed, by elevating the appearance of slenderness over other sartorial concerns, Flattering clothes implicitly further the notion that there's only one way for a person to appear in this world, and that is in a slender or slender appearing body. Thus, my question to all of you, the designers, influencers, innovators, and people who are looking to break into the industry in one way or another, is how do we think beyond the construct of figure flattery? What happens whenever we throw out the century-old mandate and consider the other motivations people have whenever they get dressed in the morning? What becomes possible when speed and slenderizing are subservient to style and substance? I certainly do not claim to have all the answers to these questions, and in fact, I'm right alongside you as we try to unravel um, over a century of damage. I do think, however, that we can work together to imagine an inclusive with an asterisk future of design. So I'm going to propose to you what I'm calling an inclusive design paradigm for thinking through these issues collectively. 
This ethical design paradigm is actually adapted from Dr. Jessica Metcalf's TEDx talk, Native American Culture and Fashion, which I think you all should watch, in which he sketches out a way for designers to engage with indigenous communities without engaging in acts of cultural appropriation. However, I also think that her methodology is highly useful for our present concern. So within this framework, Metcalf first calls for us to proactively engage with a marginalized community. In our case, this means talk to the fat people in your life, broach this difficult topic, ask them about their experiences with fashion and dress growing up, have them tell you what it's like to shop as a fat person, or even better, go through their closets with them and ask them to tell you about their garments and the sorts of memories that they provoke in them. Second, do your research. Read, spend time with the published writing and research of fashion-focused historians, critics, theorists, and sociologists to better understand the motivations behind why people wear what they wear. I strongly and truly believe that there's absolutely no point in people like me doing this sort of research if it doesn't reach you, the designers and makers. Third, understand. Understand that fat people have been marginalized and stigmatized by and within the fashion industry for over a century. Although normatively sized people can sympathize with the experiences of fat people, they can never truly understand the sting of systemic fat stigma. In the workplace, fat people earn on average 6% less than their slender counterparts, and a World Economic Forum study found that with all other variables being equal, only 29% of hiring managers would consider hiring a fat person, a number that I'm sure is even more dire in the very image-focused world of fashion. Thus, in order for meaningful change to be affected within the fashion industry, we have to understand and commit to the idea that people of diverse experiences and body types have to be given a seat at the table. More than that, they have to be hired on as designers and placed in positions of power. Last but not least, create. I was at a development seminar about five years ago that placed plus-size influencers in conversation with the designers and vice presidents of major plus-size fashion labels. At one point, a chief marketing officer looked out at the crowd of plus-size women and said, I need you all to speak up and tell us what you want. In order for us to evolve, we need you to speak louder. This call to action made me so angry and my eyes nearly rolled out of my head. In our social media-driven call-out culture, I actually think that fat people and fat chinistas have spoken loud and clear. I just don't think that people are listening. So at this point, I'm sure you're thinking, what is this angry woman doing talking about this framework? Um, what does innovation actually look like in this space? With the last couple minutes that I have, I'm actually going to talk briefly about some brands that, to borrow rightfully sown's tagline, is, are moving the needle. And then I'm going to give you some homework because I'm a professor and that's what I do. <laughs> so first off, and perhaps my favorite, is Chromat. For those of you who aren't familiar, and honestly everybody should know who Chromat is at this point, it is the brainchild of Becca McCarran Tran, an architect turned fashion designer who's quickly become the darling of New York Fashion Week. She's known for her boundary-pushing, innovative, and ethically produced uh, swimwear and architectural sort of underpinnings. But what's really made her stand out is the fact that on her runway, she consistently challenges beauty norms by showing her work on a diverse cast of models. From breast cancer survivors and activists like Erica Hart, to plus-size models like Emmy, aging plus-size models like Emmy, I should note, to disabled people like Mama Cax. Becca's runways have become an inclusive utopia in the rarefied world of New York fashion, and it's a really refreshing change to see. Then we have another one of my favorites, the non-binary and size-inclusive underwear startup Tomboy X, which was founded by a Kansas City native, Fran Dunaway, and which recently received $18 million in Series B funding from Silicon Valley. Their mission is exceedingly simple, to create comfortable and affordable underwear for all people. In doing so, Tomboy X has actually chipped away at the gender binary, but also the sizing system. My point in bringing up Tomboy X is to underscore the fact that oftentimes innovation in this space doesn't have to look conceptual or overly arty. It can be as simple as making quality underwear in a range of sizes and colors. Indeed, some of the most neglected corners of the plus size market are those for underwear and activewear, whereas the market for hyper trends driven fast fashion is actually pretty well spoken for. Last but not least, I'd be remiss not to mention Universal Standard. Although the company's bread and butter for a long time has been plus size clothing, they've recently extended their size range all the way up to a size 40, a measure and an action that's truly unprecedented in the industry. Boldly, the company has been featuring women at the higher end of the size spectrum on their social media and in their advertising wearing, you guessed it, well-made basics. Again, another neglected part of the market. 
So my point with all of this is that I don't think we have to sit here imagining an inclusive design future. I think technologically and ideologically, we're very, very close to being able to do this. So um, my homework for you as we work to not imagine but create an inclusive design future. First, to the designers. Designers, you have to think past the maxims of figure flattery and beyond the ideal body in order to truly innovate and stand out. Create things that have style and substance and which are less concerned with slenderizing. Photographers, stylists, influencers, I challenge you to think bigger than beauty norms and stop relying upon Photoshop and filters. The most striking and effective fashion images and those that are going to resonate with your audiences are going to be the ones that radically portray people in all of their dimpled, fleshy humanity. And to the educators, my people, we simply have to upend and radically rethink fashion design curriculum. In introductory pattern, pattern making courses, we have to make plus size, non-binary, and adaptable fashion mandatory for all students, no matter their size, gender identity, or ability. The problem really honestly starts with us. These practices can no longer be relegated to one-off workshops and to the students who self-identify as marginal or fat. It's our moral obligation to not just prepare students for jobs in the industry as it exists today, but to cultivate the leaders and innovators who are going to fix what I think is a largely broken system. So with that positive idea, I'm gonna wrap up my talk. Thank you so much.